Beijing e Goldman. Take you. Okay, vamos gravar. By the way, it's Nadine, not Nadine. Uh, Nadine. Mm. Nadine. Okay. Okay, that's more yeah, Portuguese. That was my fault. Well, it's French. Nadine. Mm -hmm. okay. Nadine. You started writing at a very young age. Mm. How did you know you wanted to be a writer? What what drove you to write? Reading. The love of reading. And then realizing that um, there were stories I wanted to tell. But I didn't want to be a writer when I was a child. I wanted to be a dancer. And I was rather a good dancer, yes, acrobatic too, <laughs> being rather small and, and, and light. But as various circumstances put an end to the idea that I would be a dancer. And aren't I lucky because I certainly wouldn't be dancing anymore. <laughs> Do you think that literature still has a place for children um, to take young children into, into a different world, to open up their minds, their imagination, or has that all been taken away with television? It has indeed a place to make them literate, that they grow up half literate and are shut off from the joy of reading. Television or even your phone that has that you can see, you've got to have a battery or an electrical point, you can take your book anywhere to a mountain top, stand in a queue with it and turn the pages. So there's no question. It's a tragedy, I think, that um, now parents don't read to their children. The bedtime story, my children, who are in their late 40s, one over 50, um, they were read to as the bedtime story. Now the bedtime story, you're plonked in front of a television and, you know. How does one acquire a feeling for the universality of, of human nature, growing up in a small mining town with, with uh, the inevitable classifications? Well, it depends, first of all, on your intelligence, on your curiosity, that you're not just shut in with your family and your little school and your friends. Uh, to be curious about life, to be searching, you have to be born with that, it can't be acquired. At that time, there was a, a very strong divide between black children and white children. And your mother wanted to open up a, a nursery school, a creche for, for young people. No, my mother had, did no. not, I don't know where you got that from. My mother had nothing to do with a nursery school or creche. She was um, involved with the um, Red Cross. Perhaps yes, that was where the research yes. came from. Yes. And so she was one of the women who um, went in and out of the townships for various things, which most white women didn't do. <clears throat> but um, there was no connection between what she felt she had to do as a human being and politics. Took no part in politics and I presume continued to, to vote for the only people you could vote for, the, the white party, yes. Did you have any relations with, with young black children as you were growing up? As a child, no. No. But um, if people ask me how I began to become conscious of the racial situation, I must have been about 10 or pushing to 11 years old. And uh, I have one sister, but she was already had flown the nest. And there was I in the house in this little mining town in a white suburb, of course, with uh, my parents. And in the middle of the night, there was a lot of noise, and my parents got up, and so I did too, and we went out into the yard. And there, the woman who worked for us, black woman, who was very much part of the household, and indeed my second mother, I loved her, her simple belongings had all been pulled out of her room, her bed had been turned over like this, because, you know, black people were not allowed to buy liquor at the time, no alcohol. And so, of course, there was a lot of home brew, and it was suspected that she was home brewing. Whether she did this sometimes, I'm sure she did, I hope she did, but um, on this occasion, fortunately, although they dragged her simple possessions out and threw them around in the yard, they found nothing. Now, my parents just stood there like this watching it, and I stood there beside them watching it. And then the, the, the police, and there were black and white police, white policemen in charge and black policemen doing the, the dirty work, 
Um, they were not asked anything, they just didn't find it, so they went out. Now, they had not presented a search warrant, they had just gone into the property, which was private property, and my, my mother and my father had not challenged them in any way. And this really worked in my mind. And about two years later, not later, but 12 years old, I wrote indeed a story which was based on this. And that was my wakening up to the fact that this is how we lived and what it must be like to be this woman of whom I was very fond. Just going back to some of the stories that, well, some of the stories that you're telling us now. Um, that are stories I've written. No, 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 no. Just by being um, awakened to and aware of yes. what's around you and that, and, that, and that you feed off that for yes. writing. Um, <coughs> what was some of your personal experiences or, or convictions that moved you to, to write about such sensitive subjects involving social and political issues in the country? Because they were happening around me and I was identifying with people to whom it happened. So we've got to skip a few years now. Um, I used to take the train then to go to the Witwatersrand University here. I did occasional courses. I have uh, 15 honorary degrees, but no degree that I worked for. <laughs> So I just was there for a year doing these courses. And this is 1946. And of course the university was all white then. But there were certain people who had been to the black, mostly um, um, missionary colleges, who were postgraduate from that. And a few of them were allowed to come to Witz and to do a postgraduate course. So I met, indeed, a couple of them. Most significantly, one of our wonderful writers who only recently died, that was uh, Ezekiel Mpashlele, um, whose books are classics of African literature and indeed belong in world literature. And he was just beginning to write and so was I. And we had this in common, which I didn't have with the young white people my own age. Their um, interests were, didn't coincide with mine at all. And um, this common interest and the fact that we were teaching ourselves to write, he was and I was, and we were reading, brought us together. It didn't matter what colour we were. And then uh, time went by and uh, I met, through other friends, a wonderful woman, an Afrikaner woman called Betty Dutoy. Dutois, you would say, but in South African parlance it's Dutoy. Yes. And she was a trade unionist, a member of the Communist Party, and she was then um, on the run, as time went by, from the police. So. She, she was sheltered indeed by me and my friends, which involved a certain risk. But that was the beginning, that if you have certain principles, if, if, if you are totally against the oppression of apartheid, you can't just talk about it. You must indeed help people who are at risk. So that was really the beginning of my political activity, which is reflected in my books. Then time went by um, and I was married and that first marriage broke up. My daughter is the result of that marriage. And then I was living alone uh, and um, struggling to look after her and keep myself. But my friends were as poor as I was and somehow <laughs> it didn't matter, yes. Uh, and then I met Anthony Sampson, the great British journalist and writer, who came here to open what had never happened before, and that was um, a city newspaper, an urban paper, um, in English for uh, black interests, really. 
You know about that. Yes, drum it was called. Mm -hmm. And he was sent by a friend, mutual friend in England, and we became great friends. And that was about the same time that I then um, met the, the man, uh, Rama Kassira, who used to be my second husband. And Anthony was a great favourite of ours. And uh, it was through Anthony Sampson that I met Mr Mandela. Yes. Anthony was reporting one of the big treason trials, the one, the first one with um, uh, Madiba. And he, I wanted to go and hear the trial, so I would go with him and sit in the, in the audience and, and hear the trial. And then he gave me his little case, you know, his uh, journalist's little attaché case, and said, come along, you know, we're both working for the same paper. Mm -hmm. And so we were, he had permission to go down into the waiting cells where the prisoners were waiting to go up and give evidence when, when there was, there was a recession for lunch or whatever it was. So I went down there and there I was able to meet Mandela for the, for the first time. And great, enormous privilege for me, we became friends. I also met um, the great old chief, Albert Latouli, and when he was on trial, he wasn't very well, and he was living um, in very difficult conditions for him in the township. So he came to live with uh, my husband, Ronald Kassira, and me. We kept him um, in, uh, we, by this time we'd moved into this old house, and so he stayed in here during, during the trial. And that's how my connections went, you know, became closer and closer. Mm. Okay. Just picking up from what you were speaking yes. about, meeting um, Mandela at the trial, um, you've been quoted as saying, for you the day that you were most proud was not winning the Nobel Prize, but when in 1986 you appeared as witness in a case saving the lives of 22 members of the ANC accused of treason. Yes, that was the Delmas trial. Oh. Mm -hmm. And I came to it through my friendship with the remarkable lawyer, George Bezos, who's a great friend. And he asked me whether I became, I was very interested in the people who were uh, being uh, put on trial. He said, would I come and give evidence? And so I gave evidence on behalf of the people who were on, on trial, yes. And that was quite a big step really for me. So it was one of your moments, moments. Well, it was, it was something that was necessary to do and you always feel, not a matter of pride, you just feel a satisfaction that uh, you accepted that, you know, words and writing is not enough. I think it was Albert Camus, mm -hmm. the great French writer in, uh, in, uh, in yes, anybody, who said, and this is sort of engraved somewhere on me, he said, the day when I am no more than a writer, I shall cease to be a writer. It's not enough. If you live in a situation of great conflict, um, as people did in Nazi Germany, if you live in South Africa during apartheid, um, and you were um, articulate, <clears throat> you had indeed to use your skill with the word in one way or another, I think. And not only your skill with the word, but in your life, you. Mm. You opened your yes. your home to ANC militants, um, which was an act of great courage. Describe no, not great courage. No. Mm. Yes. No, well, some courage, not time. great. Describe your fears at the time in this fight against apartheid. My fears. Mm. Well. Let's say I was not afraid, I was cautious. I did, and indeed my friends who were deep in the struggle were with me in this. They would say, well, we need you as we need this one and that one, as we need people overseas to, to support us and to do things for us. The great thing is, was not to 
when asked to say, would you, can someone come and stay for a few days on the run, to say yes. And remember, I was not on my own. My husband did too. But of course, he came from the Nazi background, so he knew all about this. And uh, he often said, I can't imagine why I, I left Germany from the Nazis and came to a country where people were oppressed too. I mean, I was not oppressed because I was white, he said. I was able to, to earn a living and do things. So he understood very well, which was important, and that I had to take some, some small risks now and then. <clears throat> the only thing I, I suppose I would have feared was indeed being in detention. Yes. And for the first time in my life, I saw the inside of a prison because going to see, indeed, Betty, Betty de Torre, who was in and out of, um, of detention. Mm -hmm. And my son, now in his 50s, still remembers as a little boy sitting in the car outside the women's prison here, which still exists at the Old Fork, while I went in uh, to see Betty and to bring her some clean clothes and things like that. Winning the Nobel Prize in 1991 um, was, an important, was important as actions against apartheid were intensifying at that time. Um, would you like to comment on this? In 1961? No. 91. 91. Yes. Yes, no, 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 91. Yes, but we were only three, three years before we all voted together. Um, my husband, Ronald Casera, and I, they made the little church down here, a polling station, and what a day that was. You couldn't believe it that you stood there, white, black, Indian, this tone of colour, that tone of colour. It was great. Do you think winning the Nobel Prize at that time um, did highlight South Africa's uh, plight and the struggle? And, and, and no, I don't think so. When I came back here, the, the uh, uh, president at the time didn't congratulate me. I never had a letter or a telegram or a phone call from him. I can quite see why, you know, I was an enemy of his, so we, we remained like that. Perhaps it was, would have been very embarrassing for me to have him <laughs> say, please come, you know, to Pretoria and, mm, well. Um, winning the Nobel Prize. Um, did it change, did it change anything in you or the way you wrote or the way you believed you were, your work was received? No, it certainly it didn't, it didn't change anything in the way I wrote. And I think the terrible thing is that you always get asked then by journalists, um, aren't you nervous about your next book? You know? Well, I happen to be in the middle of writing one of my books and you just go back and finish it. Of course, people have a strange idea about the Nobel Prize, and it's pathetic that some writers, but I think they're not very good writers, um, send their books to the Nobel Committee, which of course I'll just put aside. You, if you Now, what people don't understand too is it goes on for years. I think for about four years, four or five years, I got phone calls saying, you're on the list. And I had a stock answer, well, if I ever, Win it, thank you very much, you can tell me, but I'm not interested in whether I'm on the list or not. <laughs> because I think it's the only way to look at it. You can't do anything, fortunately, to promote yourself to get the Nobel Prize, and I think that's the way it is. And that's why, of course, sometimes some very controversial people it's, get it. It so happened that Per Westberg, who at that time had nothing to do with the prize, but was the editor of one of the big Dagens Nyheter, the big papers in Sweden, through other circumstances when he came and worked here um, as a journalist to, to explore the situation here and, and write about it, we got to know each other and, and became friends. But um, now, of course, he indeed is the um, chairperson of the <laughs> Nobel Committee, but he had nothing to do with the years ago when I got it. No. Of course, one of the great things is, if you're interested, Absolutely. once you have been, got the Nobel literature, 
You have every year the privilege of sending them nominations. Now it's absolutely discreet and absolutely you cannot tell anybody, not your best friend, not your lover, not your child, not anybody. And only the, the Nobel people know about it and your name is never brought into this. But you'll be interested to know that I've taken advantage of this and since 91, ever since then, it's a long time now, every year I send in my couple of nominations. I've only had two successes. One was Kensaburo Oe, the Japanese, yes, and the other one was Gunter Grass. So I was very happy about that. But before then and since then I have not succeeded. <laughs> With reference to your writing and your success as a, mm. as, as a writer, as an intellectual, um, how, do you, how do you see your success with reference to being a woman? A success in what? In, in writing and as an intellectual leader. I don't regard myself as an intellectual leader. Um, I think when we writers we do have, indeed, a socio-political influence, but this comes through our particular gifts of intuition, of seeing into people's lives and seeing how they, they react. And how um, seeing in them things that they don't see in themselves. Graham Greene once said to me, how he was always asked, is this character or that based on this one or that one? And as time has gone by, I've been asked the same questions. But he had the perfect answer. And he said, you never know anybody completely, not the person that you live with most intimately. Everybody knows a different side of that person. And you, as a writer, with the instincts that you have, you can be in a, in a queue, bus queue, you can be in a train, you can be sitting in a plane, you hear what is obviously near you. Because all writers, if you want to know the characteristic born with a writer, just as if you're going to be a singer and going to land up at La Scala, you're going to have certain vocal cords, which certainly I think you and I probably haven't got. And writers, I don't know what we've got, but there is some element in us and I suppose everything is based on physical things in the, in the brain and elsewhere. So that from childhood we are unbelievably observant. We are watching the way people sit, the way they use their hands. We are reading the body language. And we are reading the tones in the voice. And to go back to, to Green, he said, you, you overhear the beginning perhaps of an argument between two, two people, you see tension there. Or you see the beginning of a, a, a love interest, that they're being attracted to one another. Uh, you then create an alternative life for the one that they have exhibited to you. And I've never forgotten that. I think it's one of the best explanations ever for how we, how we create characters. That um, men create women characters very intimately. Look at James Joyce and Molly Bloom. And women create men. Um, I have been challenged because in a particular book of mine, which is it, um, The Conservationist, the whole, whole story is told from the point of view of a man. And I'm not a man, but I've lived a long life, um, known a lot of men, and as, as uh, James Joyce knew women and had these instincts. Some of the characters, mm. um, women like Charlotte in Beneficiary, Mm -hmm. or the widow in Alas Fedora, yes. appear to be searching for something deeper that one is not able to define. Is there an expectation or a vision of how a woman is expected to be? Or is it simply the personality mm. of the character? Mm. No, well you see, my theory, that's very pompous but you know what I mean, of what real literature does what a real writer does. The last sentence, the last word, it's simply for you as the reader. 
to carry on. And this is how I approach other people's writing. It opens avenues into the human personality, into life, into experience, which you then follow up on your own. You, you interpret the book yourself. Another character that, that left an impression on Carlos yes. um, was, was the woman in, in the plane in safety procedures and um, who declared herself invincible to the dead. Where did this inspiration come from? Again, I suppose from alternative lives, of seeing in certain people um, heroism, Cowardice. When I think of women like Helen Joseph, like um, uh, Ruth Slovo, something always a kind of mystery there. If you compare them with what that mythical creature, the average woman or the average man, but uh, there's a process of development in such people. And that's how heroes, and what are heroes? Heroes are people who have more courage and more um, ability to face dangers and, and uh, oppression of all kinds than most of us have. It's always a bit of a mystery to see this in someone. I mean, I think again of, um, of Betty de Toy and of, of um, Ruth Slover, uh, if we think talking about women, you know, we're men obviously in the same category. There was this, this quality there. It doesn't necessarily come from a particular kind of childhood or from a particular personal experience. It comes from the choice of living dangerously and having the guts, the good old English word, guts, to, to face up to it. John Lennon once said that women are the blacks of the world. Women are? The blacks of the world. Oh. And you've said that being black is like being Jewish. You don't choose, you are born that way. Hmm. But I wasn't comparing, despite the ghastliness of the Holocaust, which seems to be quite conveniently forgotten. But the suffering of black people. This has gone on for centuries. The Holocaust was a ghastly culmination of racial prejudice in one century. Hmm? I'm not demeaning it, I'm simply putting it in historical context. But f for instance in South Africa, since the 17th century, 1652, and alas, it was, of course, the Portuguese who <laughs> arrived. But it doesn't matter which part of Europe. This was the beginning of whites. I always think of it in terms of covering over the civilization that was there, because one mustn't define civilization as something that, that is connected with um, the, the technology of Europeans. Black, blacks in primitive times also had their own technology. They didn't have the, the, the tools um, and they didn't have the knowledge, uh, technological and so on, that, we, that was indeed brought about, that Europeans discovered. But they had certain wisdoms and ideas. They understood their, their, their background. They understood their environment. So there are different kinds of skills which belong to different ages of civilization. So civilization, for me, means the ability of the human being to deal with the environment, the land, the animals there, climate. According to Christians, God created man of clay or in his own image. Mm and create a woman with the rib of a man, from the rib of a man. Yes. Is this what the Jewish religion teaches too? This image of a woman as an appendage of a man, um, rooted in our subconscious? 
Do you believe that this image has changed? No. I'm a Jew by blood and um, descent from, but I know nothing about the Jewish religion. I was brought up without it, and I am an atheist. In my 20s, I became, as one does, feeling, what is life about? And so I read the Quran, I read the Bible for the first time, and um, I read everything that I could t to see whether there was something that I could follow and believe in. But to me, they were all myths, some of them wonderful, which come out of our desire to put some understanding of why we are here. And then I come back to the wonderful Irish poet Yeats, who wrote, what do we know but that in this place we meet one another face to face? So um, I'm afraid that that um, rationalist view. I believe that human spirituality is a mystery, a wonderful mystery. Of course, it also includes incredible cruelty, as we have seen. But we also have um, wonderful spiritual qualities. Not all of us, but a few of the chosen. Not chosen by any god. Not by God, not by Muhammad, not by anybody. <laughs> so what do you mean by chosen? Well, chosen in our personality. Oh, hello, my boy. Have we got to get rid of him? Oh, poor Bodhi. Bodhi! Out, my boy. No, no, there's nothing to eat. In Dreaming of the Dead, um, you, you quoted Susan Sontag defending um, men by saying, what has made them powerless to live fully? Never mind Huntington and his clash of civilizations. The clash of the sexes has brought about subjection of the heterosexual male. We women have achieved the last result. Surely as emancipated beings we wanted. A reversal of roles of oppressors and oppressed, the demanding of fellow humans, affirmative action, has created a gender elite which behaves as the male wanted, high positions for pals, just as the men awarded whether the individual was or was not qualified, except by what was between the legs. Your response to that was, Muslim women, still behind the black veil, men suffer from them. Do you agree with some of what Susan Sondor has to say? Yes, I do. But um, again, my, I am a feminist insofar as I'm also a maleist when it comes to, to, um, to um, homosexuals. I, I, I'm not happy about the word gay because I think <laughs> my, heteros, my homosexual friends have, have adopted it, my comrades, but it mean that you can't say anymore, oh, we, you know, she was full of gaiety because that means that she's, he's a lesbian. <laughs> it's taking a uh, strange, I don't know why. Gaiety doesn't belong to any particular sex. Mm. But I can see because if you, if you suffer for your gender, you tend then to want to overcompensate by claiming things that everybody has, really. We all, we all have some gaiety in us. We all have gay times. Not all sexual, but gay. <laughs> Africa is seen from the outside as being very, a very masculine continent, very mm. virile. Um, what does Africa have about it that's, that's female? That's female? Well, I don't know. Again, we've got to look at the um, morals and mores and customs of different people at different times. And there's no getting away from it that um, traditional African society and of course, it's, there are many different different tribes with different um, customs and so on. But women do have a subjective role. And to this day, I mean, there are problems we're trying to deal with now of people who uh, give their trade, their 14, 15-year-old 15, 15 daughters to much older men. They've got to marry them. 
There's no choice for the girl. So that, of course, black women have to fight against all this in a way that I don't know whether there was ever a time when white women did, very probably, you know, in ancient times. Yeah. After all, if, if you, they believe that uh, our sex as women that is, uh, only comes from the rib of a whole human being, not much of a beginning, is it? <laughs> what is African culture in, in a globalised world today? Oh, African culture, the African continent is enormous and there are many different cultures, so it's impossible to talk about African culture. Can you talk about European culture, really? Hmm? No. I suppose where people share a religion, um, Christians in Europe, no doubt, have got a great deal in common. But they look at the problems with the Pope these days, the things that he, the, the things that he espouses, and the things that he he, he denies. Okay. Not and start from the beginning again. Yes. You said something and broke off. Okay. Um, the universe is getting smaller, and the universe is getting smaller. Did you say? Yes. No, the world is getting smaller in terms of globalization. It's getting more and more divided. That's interesting. <laughs> so, alas, globalization seemed to be a wonderful idea, but you can hardly say that it really works. The rivalries, power rivalries. Take the example now, we're in South Africa, so happy to become a member of BRIC. Hmm? Mm. So that there are these uh, smaller organizations seeking to influence, yes, not so much to take power, too small for that, but seeing to, in, to influence certain um, aspects of, of power in, in different countries. One's all for, uh, for people to, to work together. I have been, oh no. Oh, no, could you please go to the... I'm going to ask you to the Yes. Yes. Come on. Come on, go. Yeah. go to, <laughs> he Go to Domingo, no, to ask Domingo please to co close the door from the, just a minute, to close the door, okay, you're listening. Close the door from the yard into the garden. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> I'm Alexandra Moraes, I'm from Folha de São Paulo, a newspaper. And I would like to ask you a couple of questions on your next book, uh, No Time Like the Present. Okay, louder. I'm sorry. And um, you will release a new novel in March, No Time Like the Present. Yes. Which is uh, about an interracial couple. How do you know what it's about? You're telling me what my own book is about. <laughs> oh my God. Or someone's written this. Okay. And. Uh, well, is it really about an interracial couple? And why it's about it many things. It's about um, the problems of making a better life, a new life, in a country that has gone through years of oppression. You have a similar problem, less acute, in Germany, post-Nazi. You have, in many African countries, this problem. You get rid of colonialism mm -hmm. and then you have been colonised and oppressed for so long that all sorts of, um, how shall I put it, um, neurotic tendencies can come out. The corruption that is so rampant now, alas, in my country and in many other countries, no, yes, corruption, part of it comes about by the feeling I haven't had it, my people haven't had it since 1652, in our case, eh? for blacks. So I want everything. One Mercedes is not enough for me. One house with a swimming pool and um, a, a private theatre and God knows what, a t TV room. I want, want, want. It, it is a, partly a neurotic understandable neurotic reaction, but it is terrible for our countries when this happens. Because the idea of corruption then spreads. It goes down from the top 
to all levels. So that um, if I'm going along and speeding and a traffic cop stops me, he doesn't really want to give me a ticket. He wants me to, in place of, take, of uh, taking the ticket. Everybody wants a better, a, a, not just a better life, but a really luxurious good life. And, uh, and why did you decide to tell this story? Uh, I mean... But you don't know what the story is, do you? <laughs> no, but why? Well, let's suppose it's a story mm. about an interracial couple and the change... It's not about an interracial couple. It is about... Family. They just happen to be the leading Character. characters in the book. And the fact that she comes from this traditional background and that he stems from the old colonial one. Um, complicates the 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 uh, no complicates the general problems that everybody has. Mm -hmm. If if there were two South Africans of the same colour, they still have to deal with the corruption yeah. and with the the, the uh, racial prejudice that comes out. But maybe. But could. if they are, the fact that one is comes from is black and the other is white makes it more complicated. Yeah. There you're right, yes. And is this situation present in the book? Oh, yes. Mm. This complication. Mm. And so why did you decide to complicate it? Why? Yeah. Because, it's, because it's the truth about this country. It's happening. And, um, you know, I, I have, during the during apartheid times when it was totally forbidden, there were, believe me, plenty of uh, love affairs among comrades. And um, now, of course, to me it's been wonderful, one of the good things that perhaps wouldn't mean much to you. Going for a walk in the, at the Zoo Lake, you say, just after apartheid ended, a year or so after, because it took a little time, to see a black woman and a white man caressing on a rug under a tree. He said, oh my God, they're going to be arrested under the Immorality Act. So that what was normal and natural, you see white couples, you know, canoodling under the trees. We all did it when we were young. But we were so trained to see this as something that people were going to be imprisoned for, that even though it was all over, I had to say, no, 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 it's all right now. <laughs> Nothing will happen to them. Of course, one gets used to it, but... And do you think that, um, for you, if South Africa was more, uh, had more couples like this, like mixed couples, would it be better for South Africa? No, I don't quite understand that. Are you talking about the fact that during apartheid, there were still, we all had, there were many um, interracial uh, love affairs. Mm -hmm with all the complexities that other love affairs have, but with the added f fact that it was, it was forbidden, it was a crime. So that the most tender and intimate thing in one's life could be a crime. This is something incredible. But now? And now, of course, people are uh, free. I don't know, I have to talk to some of my black comrades about this. With a, there's a feeling with a mixed couple, but why didn't she, why hasn't she got a, one of a, a black man? And the other way around. Uh, among my close friends, there are a couple of mixed couples, yes. But among the younger ones, they mostly stick to blacks, um, stick to blacks, the young people together. Interesting. It was the, the, the generation for whom it was uh, daring and forbidden that somehow made it more meaningful. You grew up between two world wars, um, a world in which certain codes of conduct and, and, mm. and graces um, seemed to have disappeared. Um, did this way of being have any influence in the creation of some of your characters? Well, you must remember that I grew up, I was born in 1923 after the, the other war. And then it's 
consequence because the two wars, one made the other inevitable. So when the war broke out in, uh, what, 39 or something, mm. I was 15 years old. So I was a young grown-up during the Second World War. And um, my first emotional attachments and my first um, kind of militant loyalty was indeed to see, this is, came before the, the question of black and white, that the, the Nazis should be defeated. But I didn't have an active part in that. I wasn't in the, uh, in the women's army or anything. In your essay, uh, Beethoven was one sixteenth black. Yes. Describe the. No, they're not essays. They're short stories. Sorry, short stories. Short stories. Um, you describe the pride of some whites to having black blood or black ancestry. Um, why is this the case in South Africa? What are the reasons for this? Oh, I think because now whites feel um, we are a, a tiny minority, and. So a strange way of belonging would be to discover that indeed you've got a drop of black blood. And you see this story, unlike most of my stories, came about, what I said at the beginning, as a little preface to it, it happened. I was listening to the classical music program on the radio. And you know how these disc jo jockey types like to give a little anecdote or something. So this one apparently reading off of, I don't know, Said, announced this is Beethoven and blah blah blah, and then uh, the, the work and who was playing it and who was conducting, and then said, uh, Beethoven was one sixteenth black. I was so intrigued that he should look to, to make Beethoven one of us in South Africa, you know, not just another European. And indeed, I have found among uh, a few of the people I know. And the, the feeling, perhaps I have some black blood too to make me belong here in a way that my white skin doesn't. And I know of two people who discovered indeed they were, their origin, origin was in the Cape and then of course there was so much incredible mixing both with the indigenous people, with the uh, Negro people, because you must remember that long before there were black people here, there, there were the Khoi Khoi and the Sun who were something special, black, but not, nothing to do with those from, from the, who came down from West Africa. And um, this really <laughs> intrigued me. And so I then uh, indeed gave an alternative life, not to Beethoven, but to <laughs> perhaps to somebody <laughs> My grandfather from England, um, a Londoner, he was born in, in Cardiff, uh, of Jews from somewhere in Eastern Europe way back, but he was born there in Cardiff. So he was officially Welsh <laughs> and he they, family then were, came to London. And then there was the, the um, big discovery of diamonds. So being an adventurous young man, he got on a ship and came and went to the diamond fields. He never found anything that was worth really very much. But the fact is he was there, I think, for about two years. He was a good looking, lusty looking young man. For all I know, he may have indeed had um, relations with one of the black women there. And um, who knows whether there isn't this uh, strain, not in my blood, but in my in my family. And the question, and the question you wanted us to ask you. The question, yes, I wanted you to ask me, what am I? Um, absorbing concerns now. What is worrying me now about my country and my people? Yeah. Okay. Right. So what is worrying you? 
about what are some of the concerns you have for South Africa? Well, yeah. what we know is the secrecy bill. That is the, the um, bill for the protection of information. And this indeed is another word for censorship. There's of course also the media tribunal whereby journalists like yourself, if you were here and you, you, you would have to, you were now, it will, you were supposed to go to the tribunal and say, I want to go and um, interview so-and-so um, about the, the uh, case there is that he or she has indeed smuggled funds that belong to the, the, the municipality and use them for the that or the other. And you would have to then get permission. If it, in, if it involves somebody that uh, had something to do with the government, if it involved, for instance, the arms case, think of the, the way our, some of our people, very high up, are indeed uh, suspected, strongly suspected, of being involved in, in, the, uh, in the, the importation of, of um, legal importation. Not imp legal importation, but legal uh, acceptance of tenders for arms in, in return for, 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 for money. So that um, this is a very serious form of censorship that's hanging over our heads. And people think it's only the press. And of course, that is the most important thing because the press, everybody reads at different levels. But it affects people who write fiction, novels. Um, suppose someone, you were to write a novel which involved um, a fictional figure who is a, a member of the cabinet, mm -hmm. the minister of this or that, well then you can be, uh, you can be um, arraigned, brought, in, brought to court for um, revealing state secret. Now this everybody understands and it's in our constitution that um, certain aspects of government, that is the, the, the military and so on, this ha every country has to have protection. Um, but the personal protection of people who are involved in corruption, this is something that uh, whoever is in power as a government wants and all their, their um, colleagues in the financial world that they want to have this made um, indeed a crime. And it's very serious if you're found to have used or, or disclosed one of these tenders, you can go to prison for a long sentence. So we're fighting this very hard. But uh, it seems like ANC uh, could have done something, uh, or could ANC have done something to stop this? To stop this? Well, my dear, the, the, we've got an, an ANC-led government. Yeah. So, so um, the, the responsibility, they, they have there. part of the responsibility, yes. So how is it for you that we're part of, or are part of the ANC, to deal with it? How do you...? Well, it's a great disillusion because, indeed, the ANC is and has been my, my party. Still but as we know, people... When power really is a very dangerous thing. What does power mean to you? To me? Mm. Well, it's um, something that um, is beyond my experience. I've never been in any kind of position of power and it's not something that uh, I would aspire to. And I don't know whether I would not come be, be corrupt. You just never know how you will. But I don't think so, because I know so many of my friends who they certainly never uh, become corrupt, no matter what pressure there was on them. Why do you have this importance? Why do you have? Why, why are you the writer? Why are you 
Um, I don't have importance. I'm a writer because I'm born that way. I have, um, as I explained, as the, if you're going to be a singer, you're going to have the right vocal cords. And I apparently, like my fellow writers, have something, a quality of the imagination in the brain and a quality, a searching quality. That to me, that is what defines the writer. We're all looking for an explanation of why we are here, what for. As I've told you, I, I'm an atheist, so I can't um, uh, soothe myself by saying there is somebody up there who has arranged all this. I have to face it in myself and in you and in everybody else. The, the mystery that is life, I think, makes writers. Thank you very much. Good. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, very good. Thank you. Uh, I'm a big fan. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm better at writing it than talking. I talk too much. <laughs> well, we'll let you write. You could sign one of my books.